and welcome to Sedere International. In the pursuit of organizational velocity, communication optimization is the turbocharge that propels efficiency. Aligning messages, fostering transparency, and embracing agile exchanges not only quickens the pace, but also fuels a culture of rapid adaptation and shared success. I'm Yasmin Murray. Our topic today is the speed factor, how to speed up your organization. Over to you, Granison. Welcome, folks. This is Granison Science here with Saduri International. Welcome to the Silver Tongue Podcast, a Saduri International production. While you're here watching the video, make sure you like, subscribe, and share the video. Our intent in making these videos to give you up-to-date usability, useful information you can use right now. As soon as the podcast is done, you can go right back to your organization, your environment, and put in action what we have, what we are talking about. Today, as Yasmin stated, we are talking about the speed factor. How do we speed up an organization? There are certain criteria that your organization must have first. We'll cover that later on. But as we are talking, do subscribe. Make sure you take some notes as well. Take copious notes because we're going to be dropping truth bomb after truth bomb after truth bomb. We have two other guests with us right now. I'll let them introduce themselves. First of all, we have Al Gleason. Go ahead and take it from there, sir. All right, Al Gleason, the curator of nonsense. And uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation, man. I'm, I'm excited about this. This is uh, something I don't know a lot of people talk about. So I'm looking forward to it. Very true. Very true. And who else do we have here with us? Uh, you have George O'Chiang, the tax savvy strategist. Uh, glad to be here, as always. Looking forward to speaking about growing your communication. Fantastic. Excuse me. I'm nursing a, a cold that I'm getting over. So I'm... I'm still in my mode of, of recovery. So as we're talking, though, we have a special announcement. We got not one, but two new books coming out. We'll share those with you shortly. They are 99.9% .9 done when the, in the process of just final edits and, and reading it all over again. But these books, I'm telling you, they're going to change your professional world when you read them. And we made them in a handbook series. This is the exciting part. The handbook series, so you not a lot of picture, not a lot of pop-up, not a lot of color inside the line. This is all straight information you can use right when you are on your shop floor or on your professional floor in your environment, your department. You can just go through this book. Turn to certain pages and look at the information. It's very easy to read, but very, very thorough. We toil on these deals for uh, quite a while. So we're we're excited about it. So as we are talking, remember that we'll send you the link later on. We'll do a pre-launch where you can get it for a discounted price. And then that way you can have that that edge over competitors. That's what it's all about, right? Even the edge over so even some of our colleagues in this edge. By the way. You got to get this information straight from the horse's mouth. So let's yes. dive into our podcast. Yasmin. Grandison, Grandison, hang on. You didn't tell them how they can get it for free. Aha. Uh -huh. Ah, I didn't tell them how to get it free. I don't know how to get it for free. Maybe you should tell them because I was talking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're talking <laughs> we How are we going to get it free? We have we well, we do have uh, our program <clears throat> series of classes that they can take. Right. And once they become our client, they get it for free. Okay. So what she's talking about is along with the book, there is a coaching class that we will have and we'll be pointing you towards that direction as well. So we have just to give you spill the beans a little bit. One book is called Time, Timing and Time Management. A little, a really big spin on what you have traditionally heard from time management. And there's also going to be a course, a 12-week course on that as well. And that's how you can get the book for free. Thanks for reminding me, Edmund, because I was like, what are you talking about? Of course, of course. <laughs> yeah, you're nursing that cold. You know, the flu got to your head. Sure, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know when you're coming out with the version with the uh, pictures, 
because you said this one. Pictures happen. with pop ups and stuff. Yeah, all that that'll be all later on. <laughs> Color inside the lines, outside the line. No, it's all good. So we're okay. excited. About it. We are, are excited. gentlemen, ready for the questions? Yes, ready as can be. All right, all right. So my first question to the panel is. Uh, Grandison, you mentioned organizations must meet certain criteria. Yeah. First, explain what are you talking about? So in order for an organization to start to dial, turn the speed dial, you have to have certain aspects in place. And think about it from a factory standpoint. People, one, have to be trained on how to utilize the materials. In this case, communication, because we're going to be talking about how communication. By the way, there are 21 different topics, and we'll talk about that later, but 21 different topics. The first one we talk about is communication. People have to be trained, right? So if you're superimposing that over to an assembly line, people have to be trained on how to utilize their piece or 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 factor in their piece of the, the assembly line, right? They have to be very proficient at that, just doing that thing. Well, people have to be very proficient in communication, Every business runs on three things, people, processes, and systems, okay? So keep that in mind as the highest level. Mm -hmm. The second opportunity is that people have to understand when to do certain things, and that requires a certain aspect of understanding how the decision-making process works in your organization, where do you get the information to make intelligent decisions and or data-driven decisions. Yes, you make decisions on your own because you are... You're, you're working this environment, but you have to be able to also extract information, data, statistics in order to make certain decisions as well. And then from that aspect, you have to understand how to properly leverage the system that you already have. Mm -hmm. So if you take, the, again, the you superimpose the factory mindset, you got people who are trained, who are working on the process of their little, their area that they're responsible for, and they don't deviate from and try to work in someone else's area. And then they have the system itself. And the system is the, the, the opportunity that the conveyor belt that's moving the product down the line. And while they're focused in that, now if once they get proficient, you can turn up the dial a bit, a certain percent, and then you can have a higher yield output. And this is how a company goes from saying producing 100,000 widgets to say 125, 150,000 widgets in a year. They speed up the product line. So every organization works the same way. So you factor those three things in, then you're poised. That's what I meant by that question. So what you're saying is that you're going to train people how to talk. They don't know how to talk or communicate. Is that the problem? <laughs> that's, what we, that's what we're saying. We say this all the time. Just because you know how to talk doesn't mean you know how to communicate, right? That's what my, my, my quote that I've stapled. It. it is so true. That's why people... When they end up talking to us, they say, oh, we got a leadership problem. And they end up talking more. We you know, we asking more questions, making the right statements. And it's a communication problem 90% of the time. What do you think, Al? Oh, I agree. It's uh, You have to have those systems in place. You talk mm -hmm. about those three components. When you're considering small business, I think that's the biggest challenge that they face is when they don't have the appropriate systems in place. True, in particular, true. you know, we're talking about communication. So having those communication uh, systems in place as well. So if you don't have those in place and you try to, using Granison's anal analogy, you try to speed up the conveyor belt, it's going to cause more problems. You know, more difficult problems than what you have before. Yeah, and, it yeah, reminds no. me of being on a treadmill and, you know, it's speed up and you're going to fall. You're going to stumble and fall if you're not ready to speed up. What sure. do you think, George? Well, definitely. I think um, that is one of the most critical parts of a small organization or a big organization for that matter. Um, I looked at uh, a post recently and it broke down the word system, which went ahead to say it save yourself stress, time, energy, and money. So if you have effective communication as one of your systems, then proficiency and profitability will definitely scale. Mm -hmm. I like that. Okay. Yes. Cool. Okay. Right. Next question for you. Let's start with Al. Would be so when you hear the term communication optimization, what comes to mind? Really, for me, the first thing that comes to mind is the basics. 
we talk about the, the complete communication technique, for an example. Mm -hmm. Most people don't have that. So if you want to optimize anything and you don't have the basics, it's, it's not going to work. It's not going to be effective. So that's the first thing that comes to mind to me is getting those basics established. Also, that could mean what system you use. Some organizations have, they might use, uh, you know, text messages and Slack and something else. You know, so that you're putting your systems in place are important also. So those are two things that come to mind for me. What about you, Granison? Mm -mm. When I hear the word optimization, I think of fine tuning something, making it more optimized for strategic usability. And that's what we're talking about. So communication and optimizing how you communicate. Like I was talking about one of the more fascinating but most misunderused communication techniques is complete communication technique when you're giving instructions when you're disseminating content answer the questions who what why where when how those important six questions the first time not subsequent times however optimization talks about just streamlining so it's tight and everyone understands how to utilize it properly that's what i'm thinking about how about you george Everything that they've said already resonates with me. The biggest thing that I feel was mentioned here is what Al talked about, and that's the fundamentals of uh, communication. Optimizing those fundamentals, making them better, making them uh, crystal clear, concise, mm -hmm. making sure your organization is using them accordingly and is better trained on it, and then adding other aspects to it. Like you mentioned, Slack. Uh, now, of course, everybody does Microsoft Teams that may be a way of optimizing the communication channels in the organization. And, and people tend to think that communication is easy just because you already know how to string words together to be to make a sentence. It's not easy. Communicating effective communication. I'm sorry? I, I, I was just throwing in there effective communication. Effective you communication. communicate. Exactly. Yeah, they can it's not effective. effective. <laughs> communicating. It's difficult. It's not as easy as people like to, to think about it. And I believe that's why it's one of the more underutilized or even under mastered skill sets because people figure they already know how to do it. And we go into organization after organization after organization have no way to understand how communication works because no one has ever taught them how to communicate. They know how to talk. They walk into the organization already knowing how to talk. And they think that that's communicating. It's like, no. But then we we give them little skill sets or give them a lot of skill sets, but I'm talking about just for the initial skill sets, like I was talking about. And then, uh, then maintaining it across over a period of time, the consistency, as Yasmin talks about oftentimes, is where they falter. How do you consistently understand how to communicate effectively? That's the equation. If you can figure that out, now you have an organization that is that's fine tuned and optimized. But you, go uh, sorry, go ahead. Al. I was just going to say a real life example just came to mind when we're talking about communication optimization. I was coaching my son's flag football team some years ago, and on the first day, I'm meeting these young kids, <laughs> and I tell them to go run around the field a couple laps, and then we're going to do our warm up, our dynamic stretches. I had two kids who took off running and they were not using their arms. They were literally running with their arms to their side like this. Now, running is something that's very basic. I know as a kid, I would have never imagined trying to run without using my arms. But somewhere <laughs> these kids picked that up. And when I think about communication, we talk about the basics. And maybe for some of you all were not athletes, you don't know. <laughs> arms are necessary for you to run as fast as you possibly can. So it's, arms are necessary for you to be effective. Your arms dictate how fast your legs move. When you think about communication, it's a similar thing. People know how to talk. They know how to move, but they're not necessarily effective. And the thing that's so wild about it is because they know how to move, a lot of times they're not even open to being effective. They don't realize how ineffective they are because they've been doing it so long or they saw somebody on TV doing it that way. So <laughs> it is something that, I think is much more important than people realize. If you haven't had the communication training, you haven't been exposed to it, you don't realize what you're missing. Big factor. That, that sounds like 
um, not using all the tools that you have in your tool belt yes. to propel you forward correctly by not using your arms while running. That that sort of reminds me of Forrest Gump or something like that. Right before the the braces fell off his knees and all of a sudden now Forrest runs. So I think this process is what we're talking about. Some people are held back by braces or different ways that they've learned how to communicate. And that's why this conversation is necessary. Speeding up communication within the organization, using the effective tools that you either already have or adding some new arrows to your quiver. So that's that's interesting. Absolutely, like having the right shoes to run in. Great, great analogy. But in spite of communication, we always forget that there is two forms. There is the written and the verbal. Not only the verbal communication needs help, but written. We were just talking about texting and, and teams and whatnot. There is really a lot of difficulty in people learning how to communicate in writing. Mm -hmm. How do we solve that problem? And the Grandison, you always say people write the way they talk. People tend to write the way they talk, drive the way they walk. Yeah. So mm -hmm. when you adhere to, when they start upskilling themselves in the communication skill set, now you still have pronunciation, articulation, and enunciation, enunciation those sources, those other three factors that, that factor into it. However, the components in which, if you can reprogram someone's mind to communicate verbally correctly, utilizing the correct concepts, they'll tend to also type out or write out their words of information that way also. If not, you have nonverbal communication too, you know I mean? but we're not talking about nonverbal. Yeah. The written and the, the, the verbal that go along together or can go along together. Well, while I have you, next question is, we teach that communication should be thought of as strategy. Explain mm -hmm. to the audience, what is meant by that? Let me ask a question on top of that question. I often ask this, to, ask this to organizations. If you were to launch a strategy the first, if you were to launch a strategy, would you want it to go right the very first time or the subsequent times you try to launch that strategy or you launch that strategy? And the answer should be always is, but sometimes they'll answer it this way, the first time. Why would you want to launch a strategy, have it go awry, and then go back to the drawing board and then do it again. Subsequent times, try to launch it to have it correct. No, you want strategy to go right the very, very first time. So think about that or superimpose that over to giving instructions to your team. You're presiding over the meeting. You're at the helm of the table, people around you, and you have a project, and now you start disseminating tasks. You want that meeting to go right the first time. You don't have to meet again in order to have the same conversation then adjourn, meet again, have the same conversation, adjourn. But organizations do this all of the time. But if you utilize proper communication techniques, i.e. complete communication technique, the accountability conversation, and utilize those two together, now you have a very strong conversation that's very much so delegated to the right people because you know who you're working with. And you all you have set the expectations and you before you adjourn, you understand that they understand what you said again before the meeting is adjourned. Might be a little bit longer drawn out conversation, but launching a strategy right to the point the first time is the most opportune opportunity the opportune decision that you can do in terms of your communication. That's what I'm talking about. So my question to Al and then to George is: so what are those? steps or to make sure that your strategy is correct expound on that a little bit well first i think you need to look at it from a holistic perspective mm -hmm. this is not just this isolated situation or incident if you are the ceo this is how you have to decide that this is how you're going to communicate with everybody if that does mean schedule meetings if that does mean taking advantage of different uh, technology channels to get that done. You also need to have your roles and responsibilities clearly defined 
so that when you're communicating, you're only communicating to the right people. Some people don't need to be exposed to the information that you're sharing in this particular situation. A lot of times, if too many people know, all of them might start trying to solve the problem in their own different way, which causes more, causes more problems. You have too many too many chefs in the kitchen, so to mm. speak. So I think you need to do it from a holistic perspective, have a plan for how you're going to do it. You have a plan for if things don't work as we expect them to, what is our what is our way of communication in those situations? Mm. What level of autonomy are we giving our leaders to make decisions? We give them a directive mm -hmm. and they have X amount of freedom to go do that. Some leaders get caught up in trying to have their hand in every little decision. They're micromanaging. Well, if you're going to do the work yourself, you don't need to hire somebody to do it, right? You need to delegate and let them do it. Mm -hmm. What is your system for de delegating, right? So thinking about this, from a holistic perspective, how are you going to communicate, even time frames of when you communicate, when you set deadlines, those types of things. So you can run like a well oiled machine. Thank you. How about you, George? What do you think? Uh, to piggyback on to what Al said, looking at it from a holistic standpoint, also looking at it from the end in mind. So you have a goal that you're trying to accomplish. I would start from then reverse engineer it all the way up to the point that your first initial level of communication either needs to go to the some, the person that's right beneath you, your right-hand person. Either, if you're a CEO, it might be the COO or the CIO. Then work it all the way back down. But as long as those strategies are in place, those extra technology pieces that are required to get this done correctly, and you also have the end in mind. I think it's easier that way to figure out how to clearly and concisely communicate the goals that you're trying to achieve. And then that way you're able to circumvent too many chefs in the kitchen. You're able to keep from people coming back over and over again for a deeper explanation. And that way you can delegate correctly what's necessary and who needs to hear it based on, I guess, the idea or even just the technicality of, of the instructions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The problem happens when they delegate a certain task and it's never followed through. There is no time limits, there is no end goal, and they fail to delegate. How would you utilize or what would you utilize to make sure that the delegation is followed up and followed through till the end? This is where systems come into place. <clears throat> if, an org if an organization has, and some of them don't have, say, for instance, a project management system in place, even to just monitor that, mm -hmm. it has push notifications, has reminders, has other information that gets pushed to a different direction in an organization if you set the process up right. So you take your written process or one that's drawn out and you put it into the system that can create that you can have ad hoc processes in and if you don't have that you will have people who don't remember to follow up how many times have we not remembered to follow up i remember when i was in corporate that was one of the skill sets that my mentor was like you need to learn how to follow up better and then i got better when i learned how to do that one do you have another opportunity where people just don't have a way to track the information you'll have another way where people can go in look for the, the information for themselves because someone else put it in there and they have the permissions to look at it maybe not change it but to look at it until it's time for them to get the particular project so if you don't have these clear ways of communicating these channels of communication in place then you're going to falter no way you can just think everyone's going to be on the same page all by themselves without tools no it's, it's really it's highly improbable well, that leads me to the next question. When speeding up an organization's operations, establishing clear channels, <clears throat> excuse me, of communication is imperative. Explain why this is true. Who do you want to go first on that one? I can go. Well, know. let's uh, take George. Oh, wow. Speeding well, up the organization's communication channels. I think that's paramount. That's one of the things that you want to have in place while growing the communication. So 
with the framework in place, are you going to use Slack? Are you going to use a certain, whether it's a CRM in the within the company and use that CRM to be able to track uh, the company's KPIs? Your performance is going to be greatly predicated on how certain directives are achieved all the way through. So using the right technology and also making sure everyone has access to that technology and knows how to use that technology, I think yes. would be a better way of speeding up communication within the organization. That's the key that they know what that technology is. Just sure. really, I'll give you a great example. One of our clients changed the way they intake, um, they um, clock in and out. And a lot of people don't know how to clock in and out just just recently and they missed clocking out or clocking in and they have no idea and now there is chaos mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the communication between hr and the rest of the team didn't happen they did get trained but not to the point where it is seamless how do we make sure or a corporation can make sure that anytime a change happens it starts from top to bottom or it's filtered from top to bottom that's yeah. important. That's the where the rubber meets the road there. And that's where a lot of organizations have their challenges. But that's the only that's also the reason why we have a communication plan for organizations that we par partner with. If they decide to understand how do we take information from the top of the organization, how do we filter it all the way down to the specialist level or the client facing clients of the or client facing employees of the of the organization. How do we understand that message is conveyed throughout every single level of hierarchy and disseminated correctly? And there's a very strategic way to do that. To do that, it's not easy, but it's very, very strategic. And you have to actually have trained, been trained one in communication, but you also have to do some experimentation in the organization before you really launch it. And that's where the communication plan. Most organizations don't have a communication plan. When they think of communication plan, they're thinking about of a marketing communication plan. We're not talking about that. We're talking about how does the CEO or someone on the board communicate their message to the CEO so it's permeated down throughout every single level, no matter how far and wide the organization is from a hierarchy standpoint, to make sure it's done effectively. That's a that's a very daunting task. Yes, but sometimes, Granison, to speed up the organization, they don't do the test. And when Very you true. don't do the test, things go awry. Yeah. The organizations will test. It's ten, very tantamount to creating this new process and not testing it out in a smaller environment first before you launch out the whole entire organization. Absolutely. Yeah. And lessons learned. And document the lessons learned and not Absolutely. make those same mistakes again. Yes, exactly. That's a really important piece of the communication plan. Documenting lessons learned because you're going to learn something as even in the smaller test environment and you need to leverage those lessons in order to permeate the right communication across all channels going forward before you really launch it out to organizations the, the entire organization absolutely what do you think al i was just going to say i would add training into that as well right training is a way that you communicate to your organization when mm -hmm. there's changes happening and yeah. i don't know that organizations realize that i want to say something before i forget we always talk about miscommunication being a $37 billion per year problem. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we mentioned that in this, uh, this round table today. I saw another study that was done. This was done in 2023 that said miscommunication ends up being roughly 18% of an employee's annual salary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Maybe the $37 billion problem. You feel like you're a small organization and you you, you only got two cents in on that. 18% of the salary that you pay your employee is lost because you aren't aware of how to communicate effectively. Wow. Yeah. That's really a tough pill to swallow. <laughs> it is. Throwing away. If, you're, if your employee is making... $65,000 a year, $12,000, you're just throwing away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Wow. So it's actually costing organizations a total of $72,000 for that employee because you got to add that 18% on right. top of that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's what that, and that's the waste that organizations are spending 
more so over and above the salary for the employee. It's exactly the way that's calculated. Exactly right. Yes. Yeah. And in larger organizations, typically, we're talking about, I think we've been picking on smaller organizations a little bit, but larger organizations aren't really as effective as this because they do contribute a large part to that $37 billion per year problem. Mm -hmm. They're making money. And a lot of times people make the mistake of thinking because you're making money, everything is fine. Mm -hmm. But this is a serious problem that organizations need to address. Right. right now. And that's another thing. I want to leverage that conversation too. Building on that is organizations need to understand how to calculate dollar amount of that is associated to community miscommunication in organization. Most of them don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm not giving it free right now, but but most organizations don't know how to calculate miscommunication down to bottom line dollars. Yeah, the time they spend on following up and following up and following up. That that is a lot of time wasted. Yeah, yeah. A lot of time. That's wasted. right, and that's not including opportunity costs and things like that. That's that's straight salary from time wasted and or ordering the wrong materials and things yeah. like that. All that stuff. Yep. Um, yes. A lot of variables in that equation, or a lot of variables can go into that equation. But if you just talk about salary and time wasted, it's a very easy calculation. But if you really want to get thorough, there's all these other variables that are associated with it, too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. My next question to you, gentlemen, and uh, Al, if you would take this one How can organizations leverage technology systems to speed up the operations of an organization? Give me some examples of certain technologies. Well, once the plan is in place, and I think I alluded to it earlier, but let's mm -hmm. say you decide that you want to use uh, Slack, for instance, then you need to establish that as the communication channel for everyone on a particular team or a certain business unit within an organization. And then from there, you can leverage things like push notifications so that people are getting information real time. Also with that, if you establish a way of, you know, which channels are for which things, you know, that's something else that needs to be considered in that. If it's, you know, information for a job site, maybe that's communicated on Slack, but if it's something that's more serious, maybe that needs to be a text message. All right, maybe that needs to be a phone call. Actually, if it's serious, I'm gonna say it needs to be a phone call. Absolutely. <laughs> right. That $37 billion problem is because of trying to communicate <laughs> the technology when you shouldn't be. So I think that's that's really the, the, the critical part is defining which channels, which technology you're going to use for what, and then sticking to that. You know, don't don't try to use Slack because you were already in there when you should have been making a phone call. That type that's of thing. right, because even in Slack, I've worked with, with Slack. By the time your question is answered, you're like way down there. And now you're trying to find what is the answer to my that's question. Right. That also wastes a lot of time, especially if it's an urgent or important question. Yeah, pick up the phone and make that phone call. What do you think, George? Uh, definitely right there with Al on that uh, issue. I think also looking at what type of information you're trying to put out and when. So just like Al said, if you've got a general question for the whole team, put it on Slack. But if it's something that requires more in-depth conversations, you may want to direct either a direct email or like he said, just pick up the phone and call. That may cut down on the $37 billion mistake or loss in time wasted and also resource management. All right. Thank you. Granison, did you want to add something to this? Because I have one more question for you. Yeah, okay. Processes and systems can work together. And when organization, you can utilize systems and the process together to take out the decision-making, the extra decision-making factor for the organization, and that can also speed it up. What I mean by that? Meaning, for instance, if you have, if there's a certain way of doing a certain thing in the organization, it should be written down, process map, and utilized in inter internal in the system. So therefore, people don't have to think too much on that. Not trying to create robots. We want some autonomy. We want some decision-making power, of course. But if you can not have people start ad hocing a process because it's already written and it's defined, you take out the decision-making process. What, what should I do? 
You also take out the ramp up process. If you put a new person in that spot, someone moves out or goes on vacation, put someone else there, they should be able to go to your system or a system, even if it's a shared system where they can download PDF, whatever, look at what, what the steps of the process are and then understand how to move forward from that point where they are and maybe not have to go ask somebody who's not available at this time that can answer the question. You know where you can go get it, look at it, and then continue on. So if you take out the, the extensive decision-making factor by having the process written down, leveraging the system, you can also speed it up that way too. And people, process, and systems working together. And I, I want to ask something else before you go to the next question you okay. ask. Technology is best for information, not communication. I don't know we're talking about the communication umbrella, mm -hmm. but when you think about disseminating information, uh, times, dates, locations, things of that nature, technology is amazing. But if you use it to communicate, like I mentioned, higher level conversations, maybe something that needs to be it needs to be a discussion. Using technology is not the best option because that is what opens the door or is what opens the door for that that uh, the losses that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, so really. just something to keep in mind just as a general rule of thumb. That could actually waste time that way too. Exactly. Yes. <clears throat> it's difficult to sometimes you can phrase a, a sentence or a command differently based on tonation. So of course by a text or email that's not felt the same way as opposed to if I pick up the phone call and I say, hey, listen, I need this now, not now and next week. I need it now. So that that makes a lot of sense. Right. Yes. Yeah. I use all caps. It's because I'm excited. But people <laughs> call me to get upset because they think I'm angry. You know, I'm yelling at me. Stop yelling at me. La, 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 la. <laughs> so Finally, I want to go back to one issue that we talked about earlier was the delegation and follow up. A lot of leaders are of the mindset that once they delegate, if they follow up again and again, that gets termed as micromanaging. But if you don't follow up, things don't get done. So how do you decide when follow up is too much? when it becomes micromanaging. What's the difference between the follow-up and micromanaging? Yeah. Grandison, Al, yeah. George, any one of you? I would, yeah. I would say the, the way to avoid the micromanagement feel is to, you do your delegation and then you establish a timeline for when you're going to follow up. Do this by X, do X, Y, Z by this time and I'm going to follow up with you at that time, let's put it on the calendar now. And that way it's not, it, it's clear up front. Nobody's frustrated. There's no miscommunication. Uh, there's no uh, misplaced expectations. So there's no disappointment, right? All those Asians and are, are taken care of. So yeah. I think that's the way that you do it. Yeah. And you have to be reasonable with your time, right? The time frame for them to get it done, but then follow up. And a lot of times, uh, people are good with that because you already let them know. But if you call them at random times trying to check, then it feels like Michael Manchin. <laughs> Wasted. Yeah. Well, well said. Well said. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Anybody wants so any closing comments? I would start with the Grandison. Yeah. In leveraging speed in the organization, we have a modality called the six strategies of execution. And this conversation is all about how you execute. Communication is all about how you execute. Leadership is all about execution. So you get to the point where now that you're trained, if that's appropriate in your organization or appropriate correctly, now it's all about how you execute. And we have two, two pillars of that of the six. Let me I'll name the six words and I'll tell you. We have the speed, we have the accuracy, we have the timing, we have the power and authority or authority synonymously utilized there, savviness and finesse, so those six. Speed and accuracy should never be sacrificed one for the other. Like this. Over and over and over. They go hand in glove, never ever separate one, never ever. Can you imagine if you sped up the 
the conveyor belt for the factory. You sped it up, but then you had the accuracy not as well well managed as well. And then you have what do you have? You have more. You have a lower yield, your lower throughput for the product that's actually coming out correctly. So you're going to have much more errors, many more mistakes, many more other types of things. So it works very, very synonymous. That's why you you never <laughs> want to sacrifice one or the other. Speed it up. Yeah. The speed. reason I'm laughing is that there is a clip that comes to mind of Lucille Ball at, at a convention. Oh, yeah. The chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> and they they speed it up and she, she can't keep up with it and it's going in the mouth and pockets and yeah. everywhere else. Uh, yeah. We yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's talk about that before. We should utilize that in uh, in our conversation for that uh, that modality. That's cool. Yes, yes. Um, Al, your closing comments. I think communication is critical. Effective communication is critical to your organization. Mm -hmm. It's something that you should be ever mindful of, continually working on developing so you can improve it. Because even we we highlight some of the issues. Uh, but just your your peace of mind, you know, your ability to to be effective and your teams or your organization's ability to be effective is heavily reliant on that communication. It really goes, you know, deeper than you probably imagined. We've spent years <laughs> on communication and we're still learning stuff. Learning. And so, you know, something that you need to to take seriously if you're serious about maintaining and growing your business and, and being effective. Mm -hmm. uh, George, thank you, Al. George? Well said. Uh, I can recall of a phrase that goes this way. If it doesn't fit, you must have quit. <laughs> but I'm going to change it. <laughs> I'm going to change it and say, if it doesn't fit, you must resist. So <laughs> if your style of communication is not getting you the results that you're looking for, then it is paramount that you switch the way and even look for a better and effective way of communicating. Because as Grandison said, speed and accuracy is what will propel the business. Now, if your communication style is accurately providing the business with the speed that it needs to excel, then of course you pretty much figured out the holy grail. So this is this is a conversation that has to continue. It's a conversation that I love building up upon because for me, it's it's taught me how to effectively communicate, even though I thought I was a great communicator just because I know how to string a few phrases and sentences together. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I know I'm definitely going to sharpen this sword. Thank, nice. thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we end the broadcast, I do have a ending quote, and it goes like this. In the dynamic landscape of business evolution, communication optimization acts as the RAP speed engine. Sorry, not the RAP, the warp speed engine, propelling organizations into the realms of accelerated growth. A finely tuned dialogue where clarity meets velocity becomes the catalyst for navigating the fast lanes of innovation and achieving strategic milestones at unprecedented speeds. Ooh, I like that. What like a great that. quote. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Over to you, Renison. All right. Thank you very much, folks, for joining us on this episode of the Silver Tongue of Sudori International Podcast. Remember, on your way out, to like the video. Also hit the subscribe button to make sure you click the bell so you get all the notifications. If you want to drop us a question, do email us at info at sudurintl.com. That's info at S-E-D-U-I-R-E-I-N-T-L.com. Remember, 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 share this with your colleagues. They will need it as well. This will help your entire organization. Don't be selfish with it. We want this to get to all the way around the other side of the world. So share it with friends, colleagues, parents, sisters, brothers, cats, dogs, all this kind of good stuff. And we'll make sure we continue to have fun when we're giving you very much so information you can take right from the podcast and go utilize right in your organizations. Until next time, folks, I'm Grandison Shines here with Yasmin Murray. George, and, Al, and, and George, I, I, well, I was going to introduce you as amazing Al and gracious George. Uh. So. <laughs>